Hey y'all, welcome to Arguing for a Position or the Argument Essay. Um, we are going to spend some time talking about what constitutes an argument essay, um, what kind of an essay does that look like, um, because by now you have written a description essay, a process analysis essay, a compare and contrast essay, and this is the final piece to uh, the 475 experience. The argument essay is um, the cornerstone, really, of, of academic writing. In English 1A, uh, most of you uh, are going to end up taking that course, and English 1B, for those of you that are looking at transferring um, to finish your degrees, you have to make arguments um, in your writing, and you have to oftentimes do this outside of English um, courses. You might have to do this in a science course where you argue um, that a piece of research is the right one, or um, maybe in a philosophy class or sociology class. Um, so this is really a, an important um, essay model to pick up on and practice on. Sometimes arguments are things you're already um, likely doing in your everyday life in some kind of a way. So an argument is essentially um, just a, a logical, well thought out um, opinion, really. A specific argument will make a claim about an issue. So you can pick any issue out there. Um, it should be a controversial issue. Um, let's say something like, um, Obesity. I believe that this week I gave you a discussion board topic on obesity, right? If I ask you to make a claim about that issue, essentially what I'm asking you is to pick a to pick a side, right? Who can we blame for the obesity epidemic? It does that fall under personal responsibility, or is there something else larger at play here? Can we blame food companies for portion size and calorie content? Um, can we blame our lifestyles for lack of um, being um, mobile and active in our lives, right? So again, when you hear me say things about making claims, think of the word opinion. Issue is a controversial topic, right? So you're going to have an opinion about a controversial topic. You're going to pick a side, essentially. And you're going to support that claim with reasons and evidence. Part of the argument essay is to do research and so you're going to support your ideas with research from experts. Um, no more are we going to use um, personal um, examples here. We're going to heavily rely on the research of others uh, because that's their job. So an effective argument has four parts in addition to uh, introduction and conclusion, right? It's going to have a clear position. So think of, again of your claim or your opinion. Um, on a controversial topic, that is. You're going to have strong reasons that support that claim. So what are all the different reasons that support your side? You're going to offer evidence, and you're going to anticipate readers' objections, which simply just means a counter-argument, which I'll get to in just a moment. So convincing argument. There are three things you really want to keep in mind here. Um, and I'm not going to test you on this, um, but I just want to make you aware of this especially going into 1A. For those of you signing up for a summer course or perhaps you're going to take it during the fall, you will have to know these things. Logos, ethos, and pathos. Essentially, if we want to convince people um, that our opinion is the right one, we want to do three things. One is we want to appeal to the reader's intellect. We don't want to dumb down an argument for them. We want to assume that everyone is um, capable of, of handling this information, right? We want to present it in a logical way, and we want to give them reliable evidence. So it's something that they can um, trust that we did the work to find evidence that is um, meaningful and timely and accurate. Um, ethos means to appeal to the reader's perception of the writer's credibility and fairness. Essentially here, this is really important to present yourself as someone who is well researched on whatever topic it is that you end up choosing. Um, you want to present the argument as like you've, like I mentioned, as you've read a lot about it, but also that you're being fair. You're not just being one minded or one sided in a way that is. Um, uninformed or, or bigoted in any way. You want to create a sense of uh, fairness and that will help your readers to understand that they could trust you as a writer. 
And lastly, you'll want to appeal to the reader's values and their feelings. Um, so you're going to think about, well, who is my reader here? And, and what am I trying to convince them of? And how much will they need um, to be convinced or to um, maybe play on their emotions a little bit? Asserting a clear position. So in your introduction, you're, um, you are going to frame the issue. So you essentially have to tell us what the controversy of your issue is. Some um, arguments are going to need more explanation than others. For instance, um, some controversial topics need a few sentences of history or context so that we can understand what exactly is the, the problem there. For instance, if I was going to make a con if I was going to make a claim about um, who to blame for obesity, I want to make sure I kind of frame that argument in the introduction, where I um, probably pull up some t statistics. I believe right now, um, the last time I checked the CDC um, rates of obesity, 35% of American of adult Amer Americans were um, considered obese. Right? And I'd probably want to give a statistic like that because I'd want to sort of frame right the fact that that the number of people who have who are obese has increased steadily. And it's only been really within the last 20 years that we've seen such a sharp rise in obesity. So part of what my essay is looking at are what are the the reasons, not historically, right, but only in the last 20 years that maybe have exponentially doubled our um, our weight and then the obesity rates. So again, it just kind of depends on your topic. So you've got to um, make sure that you're kind of aware of um, your topic and you might have to give some background information in that intro. Once you do that, then you'll want to come up with a thesis. So this is the main argument of the essay. So in one sentence, what is the argument? What is your claim about that controversial topic? It should be clear. Um, and it should be stated as simply as possible. So you don't want a lot of convoluted language in there, right? I've seen students try to um, look in the, th the excuse me, the thesaurus um, to throw in a bunch of other words in there, and that's not really necessary. You want to be as clear as possible in that thesis, especially. Um, and then something really important here, if you're taking notes right now, I really want you to write this down, is the essay map. This is something that um, some of you are already doing in your thesis, but others of you maybe need to start getting in the, ha the habit of doing, which is to have a an essay map in your thesis where you forecast the reasons or you kind of give us a, a um, sneak peek of the actual supporting body paragraphs that you're going to later discuss. Um, so I will show you what that kind of looks like. So a strong arguable thesis does not need to begin with I believe, I think, or in my opinion. In fact, most of your essays, if they included a phrase like this, I probably wrote something like do not write, I think, or I believe, or in my opinion. The reason for this is that the essay is already your opinion. You, this, you're already telling us what you think. You don't have to say it again and you don't have to say it explicitly. Not only that, but in a, particularly in an argument essay, it kind of weakens or it cheapens the value a little bit of your arguable thesis because it kind of relegates it to just being an opinion. So notice here in the red, I have the sentence that says, in my opinion, the use of animals in testing should be prohibited, right? And if you read that in my essay, you might think, well, Vicki, that's your opinion. That's not my opinion, right? But if I were just to get rid of the first half of the sentence, right, and just start right here, the use of animals in testing should be prohibited, all of a sudden that sentence is a lot stronger and feels much more arguable because it feels larger than just one person arguing her opinion, okay? So make sure when you do, when you are brainstorming these theses that you have a focus on an, on a particular issue. So if I were to choose something like animals um, testing on animals, right? This thesis statement would be too broad. It says the use of animals in testing should be prohibited, right? But if I was a reader, I would say, well, what kind of testing and which animals? Does that mean all animals? All kinds of testing, medical testing, cosmetic testing, right? Um, um, prescription testing, right? What are we talking about here? So I would want that to be a little bit more focused. Now in this example, this is too narrow, right? It's too focused on one thing. Notice here, the testing of Victoria's Secret beauty products on rabbits should be prohibited. 
So in this case, I've limited the thesis to just testing of Victoria's Secret Beauty products, and I've limited it to the animals that are rabbits. And again, it's way too narrow. I probably won't find that much research out there specifically about Victoria's Secret's beauty products and specifically about testing on rabbits. So I might want to broaden that a little bit more. So notice here, I've kind of gone somewhere between the, the too broad and the too narrow. The testing of cosmetics and skincare products on animals should be prohibited. I've kept animals general here, but I've made the which kind of testing a little bit more clear. I've discussed cosmetics and skincare products specifically, so I'm not actually talking about medical um, um, advancements or medical technologies or even prescriptions here. I'm, again, I'm limiting my argument to just talking about cosmetics and skincare. So here, I've developed the thesis with an essay map. Again, the essay map is just a, um, a preview to the body paragraphs or the supporting reasons that you're going to discuss later in the essay. So this says, the testing of cosmetics and skincare products on animals should be prohibited because, and now I'm giving you reasons, it is cruel to animals, one reason, and there are more effective testing measures available, second reason. So here in this example, I've given you two specific reasons that I'll cover later in the essay, and I'm going to break down why is it cruel, right, and what are those more effective testing measures. Okay, so that's a much more focused thesis with an essay map there. Um, this right here is what I call a complex thesis. Um, let me just read it to you and then I'll, I'll kind of explain what it is. Although there have been some medical breakthroughs that have occurred with testing of medicines on animals, much of the current medical testing on animals is cruel and unnecessary. So in this case, I, you can see I switch kind of topics here. I'm talking about medical testing on animals. Um, it's considered a complex thesis because I'm agreeing with some of the, the good things that have come out of that testing, but also pointing out the fact that it's cruel and unnecessary. Um, this is a complex thesis because I'm essentially saying that both sides um, have some value to their argument, right? Um, and this is a fine thesis to write towards. In fact, I, I when I teach 1A, I oftentimes encourage my students to kind of go a more complex route. A lot of times these issues aren't very um, one-sided or the other. However, I want to stress here in English 475 that a complex thesis, when you essentially say that there are good parts to each side of an argument, it's a lot harder to, to write that essay. And so if you are looking to write an easier version of this essay, even though there's already complex, excuse me, there's already difficult things about this essay. You're going to have to do research. It's a lot more writing. You have to stay really focused on that thesis. I would say do not write a complex thesis, but just select one side of the issue or the other, even if you don't feel like that's entirely true for you, okay? Alrighty. Reasons. So your body paragraphs are going to provide detailed reasons supported by evidence to back up the claim or the thesis. Often, one body paragraph is devoted to one specific reason. So again, if I think back to my um, example from just one slide earlier with um, animal testing being cruel, I would take one whole body paragraph to talk about um, what defines cruel, how is the um, cosmetic testing industry cruel to animals, um, and perhaps I would give some research and some statistics, right, that would back up that, that argument that it is, in fact, cruel. So each reason should be stated clearly in a topic sentence. Generally, with an argument, I would say that it's very helpful for a reader if your topic sentences of your body paragraphs are the first sentences of those paragraphs. Again, it's just kind of a structural and a logical thing. I've seen I've seen it work fine without that, but you just need to be aware sometimes if you already struggle with clarity, if you tend to get marked down for um, your ideas kind of being jumbled around or or, or um, just confusing to a reader, this is this is probably a good way for you to organize your information with those body paragraphs. Uh, excuse me, those topic sentences being at the start of those body paragraphs. The remainder of the paragraph is going to consist of your logic, so your reasoning, and then that evidence to support the topic sentence. So again, this is a really key point here, um, making sure that you understand that you do have to have lots of lots of evidence to support up those ideas. So convincing evidence. Each reason has to be supported by evidence. So think here, 
What Vicki is asking for is she is asking for every body paragraph to contain some kind of concrete evidence. This can be facts, statistics, examples, personal experience, although I would really limit that, and expert testimony. This week we're going to kind of dabble in a, in a little bit of um, how to do research, but next week we're going to get really um, into research, where I'm going to really have you strike out there and see what you can find in terms of statistics or expert testimony or facts, right? You should be able to um, comb through the web, and when I say the web here, I do not mean Wikipedia, I do not mean Google. In fact, um, we are going to be working exclusively with the Chafee uh, Library. And this is something you can do right from home. But it's really important that you understand that there are lots of experts in this field and they're publishing their research, but oftentimes that is not stuff that is available on the web. Um, Google will give you lots of search results. Um, some of you might even be familiar with um, um, Google Scholar and that you can research certain topics and get scholarly articles. However, sometimes you have to pay for those. And with your tuition at Chafee, you are already actually paying into those library databases, so you might as well use them. Not only that, once you learn to use those particular databases, um, or, or any database really, you can flip through all of those Chafee databases for your other classes. If you've ever had an essay assigned for again, a philosophy class or a psychology class, and you were like, well, where am I supposed to find this information? This is exactly what your instructors want you to do. They want you to find that information on the Chafee Library, okay? So it's really important that you think about your evidence and how credible it is. Um, and one way to determine that is actually um, with the CRAP test. Um, let's see if this link will work. So I'm gonna borrow this um, acronym here from um, Cal State Chico. CRAP, C-R-A-A-P. Essentially, this is a good way to remember what, what are the things that you're looking for when you are evaluating outside sources. One is currency, right? C. So the timeliness of the information. You want to ask yourself, when was that information published or posted? Right? If it's old information and let's say from, you know, the 1980s, right? It's probably too old to include in your research, right? A lot of um, topics that we're going to be covering um, for your argument essay are actually much more relevant than that. In fact, I usually say between five and 10 years is, is probably too much. So really try to limit the currency of the, the information that you're getting. Um, again, so you're going to be thinking about currency. R, relevance, the importance of the information for your needs. So does that information relate to your topic or answer your question? And I see this happen all the time in my students' argument essays. They will try to, they're just trying to find a quote from anywhere, um, and they've actually pulled up a quote that's kind of related to their topic, but not really. Um, in fact, the article probably had nothing to do with their topic. They probably just ended up Googling a phrase or a couple key words and were able to find this thing. So that is would make that um, outside source probably irrelevant, right? If it doesn't, if it's not information that was sort of directly related to your topic. Um, relevance is also asking who is the intended audience. This is a really important question. Sometimes um, the audience of this information, it's not intended for people like you and me who are just looking to do research. Sometimes it's intended for a really specific audience. Sometimes an audience that's paid for that information. So be careful, be aware of that. Um, think about the appropriate level, um, the, the information that you're getting, right, that it's not beneath you, right? Um, also thinking about if it's too advanced. Some of the scholarly articles that I'm going to show you are going to feel like they're really over your head. Um, and if that's the case, make sure that you, you maybe set that article aside and maybe come back to it or um, maybe actually not even include it in your um, essay. Your instructors have the expectation that if you include an outside source in your research papers or in your argument essays, that you have read that entire piece, um, not just the quote or the idea that you've pulled out of there. So this is a really important component of that. Authority. 
the source of the information. So think about who is the author, who is the publisher, um, you know, what are the author's credentials? This is really important. Again, um, with our librarian, we are going to talk about some of these things, but dot coms aren't usually considered um, reliable sources. Um, sometimes dot edu's can have much more, or dot gov's can have much more um, reliable information, but dot org and dot net, they're usually out for some kind of um, profit, right, or co commercial commerce, right? Think of dot com there. Um, so these people are looking to make money off of the information that they put up there. So their facts are, are skewed, right? Um, they're in their favor. The second A here is accuracy. So again, the reliability and the truthfulness and the correctness of the content. So again, where does that information come from? Is the information supported by evidence? And if so, again, where does that evidence come from? Do they break down the studies? Do they show you um, actual examples or sometimes graphs um, to show you how people responded or answered to that, right? Has the information been reviewed or refereed? Again, this is really important information right here. Um, usually with scholarly articles, they have a system in which they peer review each other's work, which means that if I was going to write, let's say I'm a scientist in organic chemistry and I'm going to write this really wonderful um, article, I'm going to include my research, it to, I'm not just going to send it out into the world um, and, and try to get it published. What I'm going to do is actually send it to other professionals working in, the, in my field of expertise and they're going to verify that what I'm saying is actually true. Um, so we want to look for those peer review type articles, okay? Lastly here, again, think about purpose. So what's the reason the information exists? Um, this kind of touches back on to this idea here, but if the information is out there to sell, right, or to make money from, right, we want to kind of question the, that purpose a little bit there. If it's to inform or to teach, right, um, sometimes to just entertain, we want to be aware that that stuff isn't always considered credible um, information. Okay, so again, this just kind of touches on um, what we should do when it comes to an outside source. Oops, all right. So counter arguments. A counter argument in an argument essay is essentially a moment in your essay where you step away from your claim to very specifically discuss what the other side would argue and you're not taking their side. I want to be very clear about that. That is not to say that you stop arguing for the thing that you're arguing for. You just take into account the f maybe one claim or one um, supporting reason that the opposite side would give, and you say why that side is still wrong. Okay. So, and again, this is an important component of, uh, of a strong argument. Um, you have to recognize that opposing views do exist, and you have to recognize that in your actual writing. So for us, for our purposes in this particular essay, I'm going to have you write a counter argument that's a whole body paragraph. So there'll be one body paragraph in this essay that's dedicated just to addressing the other side's um, probably strongest reason. So in that body paragraph, you're going to A, acknowledge that the other side exists. So you're going to admit that an opposing viewpoint exists, and you're going to indicate that you have given it serious consideration. Again, this goes back to your writer's credibility, right? You want your readers to know that you understand there are multiple sides of this complex issue, and that you've actually considered both sides of those issues, right? Then what you're going to do in the rest of the paragraph is you're either going to accommodate or refute. So I just want to be clear, there's one or the other here. If you refute the other side, you basically say that you understand that the other side has their reasons for feeling the way they do, but then you're going to show or reason or logic or demonstrate why they are still wrong. So this is a really strong way to attack a count, um, a, a, in your counter argument, right? You're going to push back on the other side. That's why it's called a counter argument. You anticipate what they're going to do and you say, uh-uh, they're still wrong. I want all of you in here to try a refutation. So try to refute that in your counter argument. If you absolutely cannot do that because maybe the other side does have a point, maybe they have a really good reason, then you're going to do what's called an accommodation. You're going to acknowledge the reader's concerns and you're going to accept some of them and maybe even incorporate them into your own argument. 
again, be very careful here. You're not supposed to all of a sudden drop your your thesis and say, well, I, I'm no longer going to argue for that. I'm going to take up the other side. You still maintain that your opinion is the right one. You're just going to say, you know what, they have some really great points here um, and that can't be ignored. Okay, so your counter argument again is going to be one full body paragraph in which you either um, refute or you accommodate. Um, but you have to acknowledge that the other side exists. So again, uh, we'll continue to break this down. For some of you, counter arguments probably are, are kind of a new concept and it's feeling a little overwhelming to you. But just think of it again like its own body paragraph, okay? All right. And then finally, as in thinking about your conclusion, um, you should have a strategy here. If there's one thing I really wanted you to learn in, in my class this semester, it was really for every essay, you should have a specific plan and a strategy. When it comes to an introduction, you should have a specific lead-in. And when it comes to a conclusion, you should also have a specific strategy. In an argument essay, these strategies work really well. You can offer a solution to the problem. Sometimes, the, depending on the topic, we can offer a reasonable solution and that can be part of our conclusion, right? Again, some of you are still doing that thing in your um, process analysis and your compare and contrast essays where you restate everything you already stated in the essay. And I don't understand why you're doing that. Um, to, be, to be frank with you, if, you know, if I wanted you just to restate everything in the conclusion, I wouldn't teach you to write an essay. I'd just have you write a conclusion and you'd be done. Right? So try to really get away from that habit here. Uh, again, um, having a strategy helps. Perhaps instead of an offer, offering up a solution to your reader, maybe you can do a call to action where you actually tell your reader how they can get involved and maybe change the circumstances or change the outcome. Um, again, depending on your topic, you can um, make some, implication, some broader implications. If we don't change, how is this going to impact the world? Or um, perhaps, depending on your intro, you can connect back and circle back to those ideas in your introduction. So again, having a strategy helps. If you don't have a strategy, it's a lot harder to accomplish those things and be as effective and successful as you want to be. And here's a little note about Works Cited. Um, every outside source that you consulted, so everything that you sort of read on your particular topic, whether you directly inclu included that information or um, indirectly, you have to list all of those outside sources. And for this essay, I believe the minimum here is three outside sources, or I should say credible outside sources, right? That's just a minimum. Your Works Cited page is going to list all of those sources that you consulted, okay, and or quoted. Make sure you have all their information. There's nothing more frustrating um, then working on an essay and realizing that you have this great quote or this great piece of information or fact or statistic and then you can't find where you where you originally pulled that information from, what article that comes from. So I'm going to strongly suggest that all of you actually start your work cited page sooner than later. I wouldn't wait. That shouldn't be the last page you put together. It should actually be one of the first pages you've put together. Um, when you start putting that information on the work cited page, right, it becomes a lot easier to go back and find the things that you've already read. Because in about three weeks, when you are wrapping up this essay, you are going to have read so much about your particular topic that you're going to feel a little overwhelmed with, wait, where did I find that information again? Okay, so here I've also said make sure you consult your books on how to list different types of sources. But I will also point out Al Purdue and also your last um, uh, Language Success Center stamp too. You can do a DLA on Works Cited page or in-text citations if you happen to get marked down for those on your um, Compare and Contrast essay. All right, is that everything? I think that might be everything for this week. Um, make sure you guys are staying on top of everything. I know it feels exhausting. I know, um, um, you know, you just finished that Compare and Contrast essay, but stay strong. This is the final essay. This week we are going to talk about the Book of Unknown Americans and just kind of wrap that up, but also really kind of get our, our feet wet um, when it comes to um, uh, research, as I mentioned, and um, topics here. So um, really quickly, I did just want to point out if you wanted to start looking at some particular topics, 
If you go to the Chafee website, just chafee.edu, and you were to click on library, if this will work, right here underneath find books, it says articles and database list. This is where we are often going to come for our research. So if you click on that right there, um, there are three that I will teach you in my class, but there are lots of different kinds of uh, databases in here. Um, one that I think can be helpful initially as you're just maybe kind of thinking about how to approach certain topics is what's called opposing uh, viewpoints. Let me just stick in my info here. You'll probably have to do the same thing when you go to la log into those databases. Um, but opposing viewpoints, again, can kind of just give you some ideas about what topics are out there and what you can and, and can't argue for. So in this class, I'm going to give you three specific type, uh, or I think f maybe it's four, um, no, um, no, stop it. <laughs> I'm going to give you four specific topics for this particular essay, and you'll have your choice. So one topic is about um, undocumented uh, immigrants, whether or not we should uh, keep them, right, whether or not we should um, um, deport them, and what are your reasons for supporting that. Another topic is about getting rid of Confederate statues. If you've seen some of that happening in the news in the last year, right, do you believe we should get rid of them? Why or why not? Another topic is about feminism. And um, again, I'm asking you to choose here whether or not we still need feminism or if you think that that maybe is an outdated concept. And then the last topic is something that's escaping my mind right at the moment. Oh, it was about free speech and whether or not you think that we should limit free speech um, specifically in uh, on social media. So Facebook, Instagram, um, Twitter. Do we censor some people? Um, for instance, right, people who have hate speech on Twitter, do, should, is it Twitter's responsibility to, to say those people should not be allowed on there? Or is it a place where everyone should be able to express their own um, ideas? So if I wanted to just kind of, again, play around with some topics, I might come to the opposing viewpoints. Um, let's see, free speech. I wonder if it'll work if I do this. So sometimes you have to kind of play around with the key, the key words here. Um, social networking and student safety, balancing student First Amendment rights, and disciplining threatening speech. That's interesting. So we could we could just read through this article if we wanted to, just to see what it kind of says on that. Although just based on that title alone, I get the sense that that's going to be a um, uh, restricted to just students and maybe how institutions should or should not um, put, you know, free speech on or limits on those the particular free speech. I don't know why that's taking so long. Um, I could look up. Confederate statues. There was a lot of um, stuff going on about a year ago. Stop that. Look at here, statues of limitations. How did the countries of former um, Iron Curtain deal with their inconvenient monuments? Sometimes by painting a tank pink or swapping a Stalin for a Steve Jobs. So again, that might be something that sounds interesting. Um, you could read through some of these titles and see, hey, you know, just to start educating yourself about maybe your topic that you're interested in, right? Um, if you were interested in talking about um, undocumented immigrants, right, you might just look up undocumented immigrants and see what kind of topics the um, database will give you. There should be a lot of information here. Um, in fact, you'll probably even see um, videos, right? You might be able to watch a couple different videos. Again, pay attention to how old or how relevant, right? This one looks like it's from 2018, so it's probably pretty relevant. But just to start educating yourself about some um, topics that you might be interested in writing about, you are going to have to read um, many different authors and many different viewpoints on that stuff. So you might as well just kind of start getting your, your feet wet a little bit when it comes to this. So that said, um, all the due dates this week are, are maintained the same. So you have a quiz by Wednesday, your discussion board by Thursday, and then responses to the discussion board by Thursday. Also, don't forget that last stamp as we approach um, 
the, the final deadline. I believe the last day is Friday, April 27th at 4 p.m. Um, a lot of you missed this last stamp and um, every, you know, 20 points, that stuff really hurts. So make sure you try to get it done. Um, and if you have any questions, please email me or stop by my office. Bye.